So the resting membrane potential, if you think about how that value is established, we talked about that value quite a bit earlier as you we were speaking about membrane transport um, and as you we were speaking about the electrical, the electrical driving force, right? The force acting on charged particles that wants to move them across the membrane. We came upon this value at about negative, nine, negative 70 millivolts. And that is what the resting membrane potential is. So what we're gonna look at today is how did we get that value? Where does that number come from? Why is it neg negative? Why is there an excess negative charge inside the cell even when the cell is at rest. So that is the basis for our discussion today is how do we establish that negative 70 or the resting membrane potential? So we're gonna start by thinking about the equilibrium potential for two ions, for potassium and for sodium. Now there are a lot of other ions that are moving across a cell, a chloride, calcium, and so forth but the majority of the resting membrane potential is really impacted by these two ions specifically. So we're going to look at how they are behaving, how they are moving across the cell membrane in order to better understand the membrane potential. So we know that the resting membrane potential is the separation of charge. It exists because there's an abundance of negative charge inside the cell and an abundance of positive charge on the outside. Now for most cells, there's going to be a value anywhere between negative 5 to negative 100. So different cells will have a different resting membrane potential. When we look at neurons and our other excitable cells, like some muscle cells, they're going to have a resting membrane potential at negative 70. So we're going to look specifically at how that negative 70 comes about. So let's think about the equilibrium potential for sodium and potassium. And the two factors that help us establish the resting membrane potential are going to be the concentration gradient of our two ions. So we have an excess sodium outside the cell. We have an excess potassium inside the cell. Just knowing those resting um, sort of quantities can help us understand the concentration gradient. That is the chemical force that would try to move those ions. We also need to think about the permeability to these ions. And because we're looking at charged particles, the permeability is essentially a reflection of the channels. Remember that we said earlier, charged particles cannot simply go through the phospholipid bilayer. They cannot go through the cell membrane. And so when we think about their permeability, their ability to go through the cell, it's really a reflection of how many channels are open that are allowing sodium or potassium to move through, whether that be leak channels, or we can talk later on about some gated channels that can be gated by different mechanisms. So the permeability is a reflection of the number of ion channels on the membrane. Now, uh, the table here is really to um, describe and uh, define some of the terms that we're going to be using. Some of these we've already spoken about. So the membrane potential, right, the separation of charge across the uh, cell membrane. We've talked about the equilibrium potential, which is the specific membrane potential for ions where they are at equilibrium. So we've talked about some of these terms already. Uh, today, we're beginning to look at the uh, resting membrane potential, okay, which is what exists in a cell at rest. And so this is a nice reference as we begin to look at some of the other terms. So we're going to speak about graded potentials later on. Um, so as we move on, we're going to use these terms quite frequently. And here's a good reference just to make sure you're understanding uh, exactly what those terms are referencing. Now let's also think about the sodium potassium pump. So we cannot begin to describe the resting membrane potential without thinking about the action of the sodium potassium pump. Um, this is on most of our cell membranes. It's on, usually on the basolateral surface of the cell, and it is pumping ions actively against their concentration gradient. So of course, it's going to definitely play a part in the resting membrane potential because it's moving ions across the membrane. 
Now, 20% of the resting membrane potential is directly owed to the sodium potassium pump. It's also called the sodium ATPase pump as well. And when we say 20% is directly owed, we mean that the pump is actually pumping three sodiums out against the sodium's gradient and two potassiums in against potassium's gradient. And so the net movement of charge is that one positive charge is leaving the cell, right? It's pumping more sodium in, or excuse me, more sodium out, right? More sodium out and fewer potassium in. Both sodium and potassium are positively charged. So the net movement from the sodium potassium pump means that uh, one plus charge is leaving the cell uh, more than is entering the cell. So 20% of the resting memory potential already sets up this idea that there's a negative environment inside the cell because more positive charge is leaving the cell. 80% of this value is going to be indirectly owed to the sodium potassium pump. What does that mean? So we say indirectly because as the sodium potassium pump is pumping sodium out and potassium in, it's going to create a concentration gradient where sodium now wants to get back into the cell because more of it is going to exist outside the cell. Fewer sodium exists inside the cell. Now we have a gradient. So now potassium, excuse me, sodium is going to want to move down its gradient from the high concentration outside the cell to the lower concentration inside the cell. And as sodium moves, right, uh, as a re reaction to the sodium potassium pump, that is going to bring about 80% of the resting membrane potential. And the opposite is true for potassium. Potassium now wants to move uh, from inside the cell to outside the cell because its gradient is now favoring outward movement. And that would also help to um, bring about 80% of that resting membrane potential value. So the sodium pot uh, potassium pump uh, plays a part both directly in terms of its direct ionic movement, uh, as well as indirectly because of the gradients that it creates uh, for the resting membrane potential. Now let's think about our typical neuron and begin to put these pieces together. So a typical neuron is going to be more permeable to potassium than to sodium. What does that exactly mean? Uh, this means in terms of what we said about ions and their permeability, this means that there are 25 times more potassium channels on a neuron than there are channels for sodium, which means potassium has more opportunities to move because there are more channels, which means it is 25 times more permeable. Now, if we think about the ion distribution, we just described that sodium is, uh, has an excess outside the cell. It's going to be balanced by a negative uh, ion like chloride. Chloride is negatively charged. And so outside the cell, we have this balance of positive and negative charge as sodium is being, um, uh, is being balanced by chloride. On the inside of the cell, we have a similar scenario. So potassium, positively charged, and then there are organic anions that are in the cell that are going to help to balance the positive charge of potassium as well. So the ion distribution, we're thinking about our two ions, and then we're also thinking about the additional ions that can help to balance the charge between these two uh, cations. Okay, now I'm gonna give some sort of context before we get into the next few slides. Uh, the way that we're going to describe the establishment of the resting membrane potential is we're going to think about a cell that is theoretically only permeable to potassium first. And then we're gonna think about a cell that is theoretically only permeable to sodium. Now in actuality, in our physiology, we know that this is not true. We know that there are no such cells that are only permeable 
to one ion versus the other. But in order for us to really dissect these two ionic movements and think about them individually first and then combine them, we're going to look at, again, a hypothetical cell that is only permeable to each ion, and then we're going to put those two pieces together. So let's start by thinking about a cell that is permeable only to potassium to start. And we're going to think about our two forces that are going to be acting on uh, potassium. It's a charged particle, so it's going to be uh, acted on by the chemical driving force as well as the electrical driving force. So as we think about the concentration gradient first, there's a higher concentration of potassium inside the cell. And again, notice that is somewhat being balanced by these uh, organic anions. Now, the outside of the cell has a higher concentration of sodium. And again, that is being balanced by chloride, which is negatively charged. So now we have a concentration gradient for potassium. Potassium wants to move from high concentration inside the cell to lower concentration outside the cell. Um, now we can bring into the picture the electrical driving force. So as potassium leaves the cell, according to its chemical force or concentration gradient, we now create a scenario where it wants to move in the opposite direction. Remember, potassium is positively, char yeah, positively charged. So as it leaves the cell initially, it leaves behind the anions that were supposed to be balanced by potassium. So now we create a negative environment inside the cell because of this unopposed negative charge. So now when we consider the electrical driving force is going to want to pull potassium back in the opposite direction because potassium is positively charged and the inside of the cell is now negatively charged. All right, so what we have here is a chemical force moving potassium out and an electrical force wanting to move potassium back in as it is attracted to that negative environment. Okay, now as potassium moves, right, as it moves to obey its outward force and its inward force, when the membrane potential gets to negative 94, potassium is going to be at equilibrium, which means that both of the forces, they're acting in opposite directions, but now the force or the magnitude is exactly equal and there's no longer any movement of potassium. Okay, so that is the movement of potassium. And again, considering a cell that is only permeable to potassium. Now, when we think about an ion being at equilibrium, I think we described this quite a bit earlier, but there's no net forces that are moving it. The chemical force um, usually balances out or negates the electrical force and the electrochemical force, which is the combined forces is zero. Therefore, the particle is not moving. Okay, so that is potassium's story. That is how we establish potassium's movement. That is how potassium gets to its individual equilibrium potential, which is a membrane potential of negative 94. Now we're gonna think about the same scenario, but looking at sodium. So a hypothetical cell that is only permeable to sodium, and we're gonna consider again, the ion distribution here. All right, so the ion distribution is that sodium is being opposed by chloride outside the cell. And then um, we spoke about potassium being opposed by anions inside. So first off, thinking about sodium's uh, concentration gradient. So sodium is a higher concentration outside the cell. And so its chemical force wants to move it into the cell. All right. Now, if we think about that movement, as more of this positive charge moves into the cell, 
it creates an unopposed negative charge. Remember, chloride is being opposed or balanced by sodium in the extracellular space. So as sodium moves into the cell because of its concentration gradient, the abundance of negative charge is going to attract sodium back to the outside of the cell. And this is only initially. And I want to make a point here because this is a hypothetical scenario and we're only thinking about the initial movement of sodium and sodium only. Now, when we put the two pieces of the puzzle together, we're going to find that the electrical force for sodium actually ends up being inside the cell because we're now going to include a potassium's movement into that equation. So in a hypothetical cell, we are going to see opposing forces initially. And then as we realistically consider potassium's movement as well, we're going to see that the forces for sodium are actually both moving sodium into the cell. Okay, but let's first take it one step at a time. So this is our uh, hypothetical cell for sodium. Now, when sodium reaches its equilibrium, the membrane potential is going to be positive uh, 60. What does that mean? This means that there's going to be movement of sodium in the two directions that we just described until the forces are going to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And at that time, the membrane potential will be positive 60. And just to kind of give you an example of how we find the membrane potential for an ion. So we allow it to move in its opposite directions, right? Uh, we allow it to move according to both of these forces. And then when we identify that there's no longer any movement and we were to put a voltmeter into this cell or this neuron, the reading that we would get is positive 60 for sodium. So this is a specific membrane potential at which sodium is at equilibrium. Okay, now let's think about combining our two forces for sodium, chemical force wanting to move in, electrical force wanting to move out. Now, as I described here earlier, initially it's going to be in, so the electrochemical force will initially be in due to the stronger chemical force, but then eventually the electrical force will begin to increase, okay? So the initial movement of sodium will be favoring an inward movement, right, for the electrochemical force. But as we consider other ions, namely potassium, the electrical force will begin to rise.